there. Welcome to Belmont Author Spotlight. I'm your host, Anne-Marie Mahoney, and my guest today is Christine Wolf. Christine, welcome. Thank you. Christine is the author of Speak For Me, Mom, A Murder, A Trial, and A Mother's Enduring Love. Christine, I have to say, I read this book in two days. I couldn't put it down, and I found it very emotional. It, it's, it just spoke to me. Your writing was beautiful, and the whole story is just so amazing. So let's see if we can unpack some of that story and some of your experiences. Um, give us, let's start off. Give us a little background on your son, Andreas. Well, just a little background about my son. It's, uh, um, he was born in Belmont. Um, he's, all his life he has lived in Belmont, and we lived next, um, we moved to Belmont um, right next to the Grove Street playground where he grew up uh, with his brother and uh, memories. He was played there and went to all, the, all throughout his life. He went to the Belmont schools uh, from Burbank to the high school, the middle, first middle school and high school, and he graduated in 1988. And then um, in 1989, in June, he came home from his college year and um, went out with his friends. And he was all happy, all spiffed up to go to the party, you know, to enjoy himself with his friends that he hadn't seen for a while. And uh, smiling, he left the house and for us never to see him again. Which is every parent's nightmare, and yet you've presented it here just so coherently and so beautifully. Uh, the book is described as a memoir. So talk a little bit about how you came to that format or that presentation. Well, that's like, a, it took me 30, over 30 years to turn what I, had, what I was writing all along into a book. I started um, as a way of coping. I was completely, you know, murder is not seeing your son coming home anymore. It's devastating. So the thing that I could do, that's just my own way of coping, was I had a journal. I just kept writing and writing and writing and writing. Everything that came to my mind, the rage, despair. And then eventually, that kind of journal writing turned into, um, into writing letters to Andreas to tell him, to keep him informed about what was going on. And I kept writing journals over, the, over more than a year. But then also I kept writing when um, the criminal justice um, uh, office came into our lives. And I let Andreas know everything that was going on and what the friends were, you know, his friends, our, our friends were doing, and on and on and on for years and years. So then gradually, um, I'm a social worker and a psychotherapist, and um, so gradually I started thinking about um, I would really like other people to know about what it's like to lose somebody, a child to murder, because there are no words for it. I could not find words. And I looked at, I read many, many books. I bought every single book that I could find about uh, grief, but there was always just a little addendum for homicide. So basically, I started thinking, you know, I'm going to keep writing, and hopefully maybe someday something will come out of it. But I had two friends, a social work friend, who told, he, she insisted to read my manuscript, which at the time was like 400 or 600 pages long, and she gave me all kinds of feedback that it's impressive and it's emotional and this, and, you know, wow, 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 and I should put it out there. And then also a friend who was a psychologist, he also encouraged me to put it out. Then I started thinking, that's years down the road, I started thinking about, um, you know, how, how do I, you know, I've never written a book. So then I started thinking, well, there's no way I can turn those 600 pages into a book and to make it a small, something that's different from homicide, from regular grief, what I had experienced in my own life is that it was um, a violent death, a torture death. So it, it starts mixing in the grief of losing your child. And also then I realized, you know, as I was rereading my journal over and over as the years went by, I noticed it became more clear that in a murder case, you know, there's this person who willfully did this to our loved one. And then also the criminal justice system come, gets involved. Right after you bury him, you had to go to the courthouse. So normally we stay home and grieve. 
but in a case like of homicide, then you, um, the, you know, the legal system comes into play. So then I decided to make it more concise. And eventually I decided just to talk about that part that's sort of different from other griefs that I experienced. And that's how that book came up for reading the, you know, and being encouraged by different people. Sure, sure. So you did a beautiful job of interweaving the facts, what happened, the story, with your own reflections and as you say, these letters. And there really is an arc to the letters that you were writing to Andreas. I, I can only imagine that that was very cathartic for you to be able to do that, to, to sit down every day and say, okay, this is what's happening, this is what I'm feeling, and, and this is how much I miss you. Um, when you went back to write the book, did you find anything uh, different or did you have any kind of, you know, ooh, aha moment when you went back to read those letters? Well, once I went back to read all my letters, or not just the letters, but everything that I had written, um, somehow something inside of you, like an intuition or something kicks in. It's not coming from your brain. It's, uh, it's not an intellectual kind of experience where you say, let me this, this, and this. It just somehow naturally uh, becomes clearer what it is that I wanted to tell. And I wanted to show the beginning of the complete devastation in how then a mother, uh, what other parts come into it. And in our case, Andrea's friend, um, our neighbor and friend, he got killed just a few months before Andrea's. So then that came and we dealt with that and she wanted to see a psychic. And I said, psychic, I'm still waiting for Andreas to come home for dinner. But for her, it was already a few months past. So then, um, so that's how I ended up putting that kind of uh, chapter about the psyche, visiting mm -hmm. the psyche in there, about show, and showing the disbelief that I'm still waiting, but she already knew that he wasn't coming wasn't home. Um, so then that's how, uh, it became clear what to, in, what to include and what not to include uh, because uh, journals, they were all over the place. Mm. You know, it was just huge. Um, yeah, so then I just kept listening to my own instincts in a way, what might be, in what, in, and also the first, what I learned to show rather than tell in, uh, on, on my way um, by going to a, classes, writing mm. classes. And so then um, I also realized uh, the changes that I was going through, and that would be important to show, because homicide, uh, this, it's devastating. And how do you move on? So um, then uh, colleagues of mine from work, they invited me in, in that summer, not long after Andre was killed, they invited me for a breakfast in a mm. beautiful place in the woods here, and like in a little hotel kind of a place. So then I described that just to show how my life, I no longer fit in. Because they were talking about job, you know, the last weeks of work, about the crazy, you know, all the crazy stuff at work. Uh, I was working at the time as a social worker in the school system. And, um, and they were talking about other things. And it just, I, I, I sat there feeling Andreas was right next to me. And how do you, there's no way, there's no bridge. And that was supposed to be like a bridge to my normal life. But it really takes a lot of time um, and, you know, and pain and effort and, and waiting and, and just perseverance somehow to, to keep going. And then I had right. a friend invite me for lunch, um, to, you know, like a parent of Andreas's uh, friends. And those were little stepping stones somehow. Yes, yes to get and, back to yeah. some kind of normal life. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. But it, you know, I went, went to the school, talked to the school principal, so that's in the book, mm -hmm. how to gradually take steps in uh, sort of preparing myself to somehow gradually, but you go back, you never go back as the same person. No. no. I used to work with children and trauma, you know, people of war and things. And then all of a sudden I saw much clearer and I could see and hear the mothers of other children. children. And, right, and right. so you learn from that too. You know, you grow from 
an experience like that, unfortunately, you know, it's devastating, but then also you're somehow forced to sort of take a look at your life. Right. Evil, <laughs> yes, yes. You talked about being thrust instantly into the legal system because your son was murdered. And so, as you noted, you almost didn't have the opportunity immediately to start to grieve or to even come to grips with the reality of what had happened. But what I found so interesting in your book was when you were relating the facts, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened, but then you're also sharing with us what was going on in your own head. You know, you're trying to work with the legal system, you're trying to deal with your family, et cetera, and yet I love the little asides about you just wanted to scream or you just wanted to curl up into a ball or why am I doing this? Why do I have to sit here and listen to this? And I thought that is so awesome because it's, it's what people go through. You've got to march forward, but at the same time, all you want to do is just stop and say, don't make me do this. It's almost not something, I think it's just human nature somehow. Uh, it's just not normal to go from one day to your family of four and yes. then the next day, all of a sudden, you're supposed to be a family of three. I mean, it doesn't, it, it, your psyche just doesn't work that way. No, uh, It no. needs time to adjust. It needs time to process. It needs time for uh, just expressing yourself in different ways and experiencing the new ways of, of being. And so my internal voice, you know, two days, uh, uh, Andreas was buried on a Wednesday, three days after he was killed. And then on Friday, we were summoned to the court. Mm. So we had to go and meet the prosecutor. Uh, and that was like a traumatic event because he in detail showed us about the blood and we were not ready to hear that. So your psyche, it gets overwhelmed. So we need to, I learned, we need to protect ourselves about how much we hear. And that's when the victim advocate came in. Mm. And she always told me, you know, you don't have to sit here the whole thing, you can go out. So I learned how to, you know, um, you know, pause and, and know, um, but I wanted to hear because I needed to know what happened to Andreas. So then my own, my internal voice, I grew up in different cultures and I think I was always, you know, I grew up in different countries, different cultures. So then I think the reason I was just always, I was able to write it, that's just my way of being because I'm always paying attention to my surroundings. <laughs> I grew up that way. <laughs> Right. And then all of a sudden, being in that strange environment, being in a court, and I just had, I, I, I could see both all of my inner, inner life, the external life, the life that just left, the, future, the past that will never be the future, but that will always be with us, what happened to Andreas. So everything combined. Um, and then you, you have these people coming along, somehow they... Now I call them angels. Yes. <laughs> they appear just at the right time, like a friend of mine who helped us with uh, setting up the bury, you know, going to the cemetery mm. and all those kind of things. And even in the court, our victim advocate, you know, I consider her some kind of a guide through hell. She was a steady force. Yes. And I was there. So, mm. so then my writing, I just, that's what I had to write. Right. Um, one of the central tasks of grieving is meaning making. And you mention that in the book and you, and you use that phrase in the book. Um, what, what kind of meaning do you think, let me back up, were you able to come to a point where there was meaning in what happened or how did you make meaning out of this whole experience? I think what I learned also from going to um, like homicide support groups, mm. everybody struggled with how do, we, you know, first, 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 few months or years, we say, what if something had been different? And why, 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 why was that person who killed our loved one out on the streets and doing what he was doing? And on and on and on. And eventually you realize there is no answer to why, there is no answer to what if. And, um, and eventually somehow there's some kind of compassion that comes out. Let's do something in the memory of our loved one. And, um, and for me it was, um, I had to write. I just had to write, and the meaning making came out of not just because I had to, um, what do you call it, write, um, but I had to, for me, because I'm, English is not my first language, so writing meant, when I, when I started writing, 
and I saw a sentence that actually, you know, as my friend pointed out, that means something to somebody else. Mm. I said, I could convey what happened and what it means to have a son murdered. So then gradually it, that added a little bit of meaning to my writing because my friends um, and being in the mental health field, uh, I felt there was some kind of meaning making in that sense. Meaning for myself because I could see the, a phrase or a sentence all of a sudden saying what I was feeling, the, the tangled emotions, because when some, something like that happens, we are like, we have all these many, many, many emotions tangled up. Right. So by writing, then gradually you disentangle them. It, it's just like an amazing kind of experience, because then eventually from the darkness that I was writing, I would be writing about this horrible experience, let's say in court, mm. or, or about what happened to my son, then I would go out, take a walk, and then I'll see a little flickering light inside, uh, say, you know, somehow like almost my, my heart is sort of breathing, or the other kind of feeling you get is you're not alone. There's something that's guiding us when we're in the deepest despair, maybe for our, us human beings. Uh, otherwise, the world would have come to an end already. There's so many traumas for everybody. Right. And, right. And how do we go on? So I think there's some inner, something inside of me came out that sent me in different places. Very good. So, Talk a little bit about Andreas' friends, your friends. You received a lot of support, which was wonderful, and, and maybe for some people it's not the case. Uh, so speak to that and, and how you incorporated that or what that meant for you. Well, I wouldn't say support, you know, a lot of support, because basically when that happens, I think most of us, you feel completely alone, even if you have people around you. Um, so the support, the immediate support was my friend who helped us with the burial. But then as time goes by, I think friendships or, or you know, closeness, uh, everybody is it's just enough of losses. And we, we are no longer the same person. So then, the, point. then the, the friends also struggle with the same thing. They lost a clear, you know, they knew mm. Andrea. So they're struggling with that. And I'm no longer the same. So then somehow we, each one has to, plus life continues. And so we all have to go our own way in, in a certain way. Um, but then what happened to me at the beginning, Andreas's friend, since he was murdered, um, with his friends present, there were four of his friends nearby, and they were shocked, and they were like traumatized, and they were like in pain, a lot of pain. So I would have them over to come to my house at the beginning, um, and they, we would just talk and talk about you know, what they saw and, and all, just express themselves. And then over the years, Andreas is, when I started really thinking about writing the book, those close friends, they were amazing. They read my manuscript, they were willing to come home to my house. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they really, uh, they send me letters about how much they appreciated that I was putting words to something that they were struggling with themselves. Mm. So um, I think it was helpful to both of us. And, and for them to keep reminding me no matter what, even years later, I have a letter in the book that some of Andreas's friends sent to me about, but I think it's 30 years, no, not quite 30, but 25 years later. Right. And they saying how he still, he woke up one morning and there was a sound in, the, in his condo. And the first thing he thinks, oh, that's Andreas. He's communicating with us. Wow. So, um, Amazing. And, and, and things like that. Mm. Um, and that's what keeps you going. And also they, they, there was then um, the parole hearings and all those kind of things. And his friends, they came, they were there. My victim advocate, who never wavered, she's, she was always there. Um, she was a guide all over the place, and her husband. Um, yeah, and his friends, Good. they were there for the parole hearing. And they had a lot of rage. Um, yeah, but they kept com coming and being by my side. And people from my work also came to the parole hearing. So right. as time moved on and I was more able to be with friends, you know, there was a time when, like when I first tell about the, the breakfast, I, I couldn't be around anybody because everybody's life it's was so different. Hard. They yeah. were still having weddings and 
um, all kinds of things, graduations and celebrations, and that life for us had sort of ended. So, um, but now I'm grateful. Good. My the friends, Andreas, they're all in the book. <laughs> Good. You and talk about um, you talk about the trial, and then you, you jump forward and you talk about the, the parole hearings. Um, we hear a lot when we talk about things like this about closure and. Personally, I hate that word because I don't think there ever is closure. As you've noted, your life is different and it's never going to go back to what it was. That doesn't mean though that you can't move on and go forward with your own life. Talk a little bit about the effect of the trial and then later the effect of the parole hearings what kind of sense did that give you? Was that an integral piece of the story? Did that help you to move on or no? Which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, I think because the trial came so quickly, just months. Like he was, I was amazed when I read it because right. the, the murder took place in the middle of June, June and this trial was September. I was like, wow, right. I didn't know any court moved that fast. Right. But I think it because there were so many young people involved, mm -hmm. um, it, um, so we heard that the prosecutors, they needed to get as much, because otherwise teenagers had changed their stories. So they needed to get as much uh, and as quickly done as possible. Mm. I think that's the reason we were given. And um, now I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> What was the other thing? Well, just the idea of, you know, do any of these events as oh, you go oh, oh, forward, oh. The, you know, the trial, the parole hearings or whatever, you know, does that give you a sense of a uh, moving forward? There's not going to be closure, but are you able to sort of put that aside? Well, the reason I might have been able to put that aside, you don't put it aside because, because the person in our case, he denied that he did it for 10 years. And we right, lived yes. through a horrible time because, you know, things, I don't want to mention everything, but no. there was like, so it was a very stressful time uh, in the harass one of Andreas' friend, a defense attorney forever and ever. But eventually, um, I wouldn't say it's a healing, but it, it's something you had to go through. Right. Uh, but I think what was most healing, and I had a lot of rage still, why did the guy didn't, you know, why is he coming out so soon? Mm. Uh, we all wanted to just keep in, in my son, I had to look out for my own, my son, my remaining son, mm. and they were all in Andreas's friends, so I did not want him to be released. But what helped me the most, I think, for myself, and then I was able to help Andreas's uh, friend and Tom's, you know, Andreas's brother, is that um, I had, um, letter communication with the um, person who killed my son. You know, he, at some point, it just came out of the blue and there was a letter from him. And at first I was really, and I put that in my epilogue. Mm -hmm. At first it was really very, very painful. But then I kept thinking and thinking and thinking and being a therapist, I said, hmm, here's my opportunity. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can send some letter back. And maybe, because I know the criminal justice system is not perfect, and he might, if, Nothing is done, and he has no. I wanted to know why he did it. So if nothing changes, and then he's just going to come out after the first fifteen-year parole, first mm. parole, then I'll be, then I'm going to be all afraid and still have a lot of rage. But then by writing the letters to him, um, and he started answering when we started communicating, uh, quite a while. Uh, first a few months before the first parole hearing. So and that was very, you know, sort of hopeful to me that he was co contributing and how he's trying to change his life mm. behind bars. He didn't quite say that he really did it, but at least he was saying, you know, that he's changing his life. And then the, the first parole hearing came and they asked, asked you know, they talked about him and, and they asked him, would somebody like you be, should be let out? And, he, and I was so impressed. He said no, because he, so I felt that was my hope that he was changing and then we kept in touch another two, you know, for the next parole hearing, uh, we exchanged more letters and Good. he became more and more able to tell me and answer questions that I had. And I thought that was really helpful. So when I went, or we all went to the second parole hearing, I was sort of like uh, prepared that maybe, you know, and I write about that in my epilogue, mm. um, that he might really be truly, he said he will dedicate his life to Andreas and to me 
Okay. And he acknowledged the pain that he caused his mother and me, and I believe them. So, uh, so when the parole hearing came, Andreas' his friends were upset because I don't think they were there and they saw what he did. Right. And my son was still suffering, you know, my son. And, and, oh. But somehow that helped me the most, knowing somehow that the murderer is also a human being. And he, he was trying, at least in our case, he was a teenager, he was 18 years old, mm. and I really appreciated him. Sort of, you know, that helped me, I think, the most when you say about the, the court system and all of that. That was very painful because you just keep going. Right. And it's really, you have no control over it. it. Yeah. And then also he was just second degree, which, and then they, they kept going and going for 10 years. They didn't do it. That was not a good experience. No, I can imagine. But then finding a way to move forward during that time, I kept working. My son kept working. He went to my, my remaining son. He went to law school. So we kept, and my husband, he kept yep. working. So we yeah. all did the best we could. We marched forward, right. <laughs> but that's good. Excellent. Um, so you've talked a lot about having to write the book to deal with your own feelings and your own need to just get it all out there. What do you hope the book can be, though, for other people? Who would you like to read your book? Well, I... Well, look, we <laughs> talked earlier about, you know, is this sort of a cautionary tale? You know, can somebody pick this up and say, wow, this is terrible. I don't want this to happen to my son, my brother, my friend. Well, originally, whenever we met with Andreas as friends, um, you know, years ago, it was the... the what also kept me writing and hope, being hopeful that it will be like in, a, a, like in high school, a high school reading for kids, mm. just to learn, you know, especially kids who don't grow up with m violence around them. They're, these, my Andreas's friends, and they were, they were naive. They were just, they didn't expect what came, came to them. Um, so if that book can help other teenagers, to come up with different decisions if they're faced with some kind of difficult moments. So, and then also, in, since I'm a social worker in, in, in a mental health field, I'm hoping it will be reading in social work schools or in um, criminal justice programs. Sure. Yeah, yeah, or, that would be perfect. Um, psychology programs. Right. Things or like even, that. you know, uh, the DA's office. DA's office, yeah. You know, they've got their job to do, and we understand that. But for them to understand the ramifications on the victim's family, I think that's critical. Yeah, well, if anybody takes it, wants to get more information, take a look at my uh, at the book's webpage. Yes. Uh, and it's interesting, the prosecutor, that's just what he said, mm. that it should be reading for anybody who's going to be a judge yes. or a defense attorney, yes. prosecutor. <laughs> All of the above. Yeah, all the legal, yeah. So um, I they think they're going to show the, the... They will, yes. They'll, they'll do a trailer. Yeah. Yes. So before we wrap up, what's next for you? Do you think you'll do some more writing? Well, I've been writing all along. I was started writing before Andreas was killed. So okay. about my own life, because I grew up in different cultures, different languages, different... Mm -hmm. During war, my parents, they were refugees. And they lost, you know, they were in the Second World War. So I want to write about more about how do children survive and our reality in nowadays. So how do children actually survive? What's in us? Right, that, that gets <laughs> us through. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this has been a very sense. interesting conversation. Thank you so much for sharing with us because I know how hard it must be even now to talk about this. Um, well, the book, Christine Wolf, Speak to Me Mom, A Murder, A Trial, and A Mother's Enduring Love. And I think the enduring love is what comes through in this book very beautifully. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm Anne-Marie Mahoney. This has been Belmont Author Spotlight. Thank you for joining us.